Have you ever thought that if I could be born anywhere in the world, I would like to be born, where would that be? If I had my choice, if you had your choice of being born anywhere in the world, where would it be? If you had your choice of picking a family to be born into, which family would you want to be born into? I hear people tell me all the time that I'm lucky because I was born in America. Maybe, maybe not. Why does, what, well, I don't know what luck has to do with anything actually. But people tell me that. Or, you know, you're, you're just lucky because you were born into a family with a mom and a dad that loved you. I don't know what part luck has in any of it. Because when, when, when you were conceived in the womb of your mother, you had no choice in the matter. You didn't have any choice in who she was, who your father was. You didn't have any choice of where the location was or even what generation of time it would be. If you could have been born in any time period, what time period do you think you would have enjoyed being born into? It doesn't matter because you didn't have a choice. None of these things do we have a choice in. We didn't have a choice to, we didn't choose our parents. We didn't choose the country of our birth. We didn't choose the generation or the time of our birth. We just showed up. Your mom went into labor and you were born and you got your first swat and you cried your first noise and there you were. You had no say in the matter. And to this day, you don't have much say in that matter. You can pick your friends, but you can't pick your family. You're kind of stuck with who you have, like it or not. You may as well make the best of it, we say. But that's not the way of our salvation. We've been studying Romans 8, 9, 10, 11 here. And, and, and we see how in, in it comes to our salvation, God chose us in him. Before the foundation of the world. Our salvation was not in our own hands. It wasn't of our own doing. It didn't matter where we were. I've heard people's testimonies of being, coming, being, being called to salvation in some very strange places. Prison. Hospitals. Countries where the gospel was not even allowed to be proclaimed. Yet people are called to salvation. Children in Sunday school, like my father, being called to Christ. A man three days before he dies, 90 years old, opening his heart and receiving Christ and dying three days later. We don't, God calls us, and when, we call, when he calls us, we hear that call. And those who hear the call have the opportunity to receive the call to be saved. And looking backward, we say, thank you, God, for choosing me. Romans 11 provides a bit of clarity to some and confusion to others. I hope it brings clarity today. Remember Romans chapter 9? Paul begins Romans 9 and he says, he says I, I, I would long for those of Israel to be saved. He says, if I could trade my own salvation, I would do so if Israel would be saved. Chapter 10, he starts, brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Paul had a burning desire of his heart that the people of, of his nation, those who had rejected Christ, who yet were initially God's chosen, that they would come back to him. It's almost as if chapter 11, God answers Paul's prayer, God responds to Paul's cry. I'm going to take, a, take you on a walk through some New Testament passages. And I want you to understand today that Israel rejected God. And Israel lost the saving favor of God. If you were here a few weeks ago in Romans 8, we talked about the saving grace and the saving favor of God. 
and, when, and God puts his favor on us that, that we may be saved. But Israel, they rejected God over and over. And we're going to see this and we're going to understand that they lost the favor of God. But Romans 11 comes back and says that yet God still has those who will be saved. Remember Elijah? Oh God, woe is me. I'm the last one. There's nobody left. Remember him? What did God say? No, no, no. You aren't the last one left. I've got 7,000 left. It wasn't seven. And it wasn't seven million. But it was a substantial amount of people that were still left that were God's following the Lord in the nation of Israel. And it's it's almost like God answers the cry of Paul's heart and says, Paul, I'm not done with Israel. I'm not done with them. And I want us to look at Romans 11 and try to understand God's amazing, unchanging, steadfast love for his own people. Father, we pray for your guidance today. Might we know your direction. May your spirit confirm your truth to our hearts, we pray in your name. Amen. Luke chapter 20, verses 9 to 18, we, uh, we, had this, we had this morning this read to us, the parable of the vineyard, where the owner builds a vineyard, and he hires tenants to watch over and keep it. In the harvest time, he sends his tenants to go and, and, and to, to, to get the money and the harvest that, that belongs to him. It was his vineyard. The harvest belonged to him. But the owners, they, 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 the workers said, no, we're going to keep it for ourselves," And they sent his, his, uh, his workers away, his messenger away. He sent other messengers. They beat him. He sent other messengers. They killed him. You understand this parable, right? This is a parable of Israel, the vineyard of God. Throughout the Old Testament, they're called God's vineyard. Jesus used this illustration in John 15. I am the vine. You are the branches. This idea of the Lord's vineyard is very consistent. So the Pharisees knew what he was talking about. The messengers that were sent to receive the fruit of the vineyard were the prophets. God sent prophets to Israel over and over. And what did Israel do? They rejected the prophets. They beat the prophets. They killed some of the prophets. Remember, they threw Jeremiah in a pit of mud where he was expected to die. The prophets were terribly mistreated. And so in the parable, the landowner says, I know, I'll send my son, they'll respect my son, they'll give him what belongs to me from my vineyard. And what did they do to the son? They killed the son. What is this a parallel to? The Lord Jesus Christ coming to the people of God, the very vineyard of God, and the owner of the people working the vineyard, the tenants of that vineyard, kill the son. In Matthew, I mean, in Luke 20, I want you to notice what he says here. Luke 20, verse 16. What will the owner of the vineyard do? Verse 16. He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Israel was the people of God. They were God's chosen. They had the law and the prophets. They had the message of God for the world. They rejected God. They rejected the message. They rejected the messenger. They rejected the son. What did God do? He gave the message to the Gentiles. He said, fine, you don't want me. The message will go to the Gentiles. The Gentiles will be the ones now who will deliver my message. They will take care of my vineyard. They will have my church. It was taken from Israel and given to the Gentiles. In Mark 11, there's a, there's a, this is a, a, a situation in the life of Jesus where he, he sees a fig tree. And a fig tree is supposed to have figs on it. This is the season. And there should be some figs on the fig tree. The, 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 the fruit was a demonstration of life, a demonstration of purpose. He comes up to the fig tree. There's leaves on it, but there is no figs. And what does Jesus do? He curses the fig tree and says, die. The next day, the apostles come by, and the fig tree is withered to its roots. What is Jesus teaching here? 
Was this just because he was hungry and lost his temper and killed a tree? Of course not. He's teaching a lesson to Israel. You're the fig tree. You're supposed to be fruitful. You have, there is no fruit coming from you. There is no reason anymore for you to be my people for now. And Israel, as a carrier of the gospel, completely dried up. They were no longer fruitful. In Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, there was a revival. Where was the revival? What city was the revival in? Jerusalem. Peter preaches. 3,000 people. What people were they, Jews or Gentiles, that were converted that day? Mostly Jews. There were people from other countries, but mostly Jewish. A few days later, he preaches again, and 4,000 are converted. Now they've got 7,000, and it says daily people are being converted. And you might think that the nation of Israel would respond to this, but in Acts chapter 8, in verse 1, we find they didn't respond as a nation. Acts chapter 8, verse 1, the day that Stephen's, Stephen is, is, is martyred for his, his faith, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. So here they have an opportunity to receive the message of the risen Jesus. Some of them do, but by and large, what does the nation do? They continue to persecute the messengers of the true God. Israel is still rejecting God's plan for their salvation. But the apostles, they're all Jewish. They're all wanting to reach people with this wonderful message of the risen Jesus. But in Acts 10, we find God's call to the Gentiles. It be, it's beginning. A man named Cornelius, an Italian ca captain, is praying. He's seeking God. And God sends him a message and says, go to Joppa. There's a man there named Peter. Go ask him to come to you. If you're familiar with the story, it's really quite interesting. Peter goes up to take a nap in the middle of the day. Maybe some of you, like I, enjoy an afternoon nap. Peter's lying down in his afternoon nap, and he has a very strange dream. A sheet comes down from heaven. The sheet opens up, and in it are all manner of unclean animals. If you're familiar with the Old Testament law, there were certain animals they could eat, certain animals they could not eat. It depended on how they chewed their cud and on the, 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 the division of the hoof. And there were some very specific animals they could and could not eat. The sheet, as it opens up, is full of animals that were unclean for a Jew to eat. And a voice comes in Peter's vision and says, wake up, kill these animals, and eat them. Peter says, no way. I've been a faithful Jew my whole life. There's no way I'm going to eat these animals. And he goes back to sleep. This vision happens three times. At the end of the third time, he says, no, I can't eat this. I've never eaten anything unclean. It's a knock on his door. It's the men from Cornelius. Peter puts two and two together, says, I think God's got a message for me. I think God wants me to go with these Gentiles and to preach to them the gospel of Jesus Christ, which he does. He preaches, and the Holy Spirit comes upon the house of Cornelius, and they are all Gentiles gloriously saved. Acts chapter 10, verse 42, here's Peter's sermon. You have to respect Peter because this is not who he would normally preach to. But he says in verse 42, He commanded us, speaking of Christ, to preach to the people, and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Aren't you glad Peter was an honest preacher that day? He used the word all. All who believe in him will be saved. 
While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers, the Jews, who had come with Peter, were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. I look back and say, hallelujah, the Spirit of God was poured out on Gentiles. That's us. God opened the door through Peter that the Gentiles would come and hear the word and be saved. Well, this caused quite a stir. And so in Acts 15, there's a story of all the apostles and elders and leaders gathering together for a council. What are we going to do with Gentile converts? Do we make them Jewish? Do we give them the law and say, keep the law? What are we going to do with these Gentiles who are being saved? We cannot deny their salvation, but they aren't like us. They eat unclean meat. They drink unclean drinks. Their, their lives are not, are not following the law of Moses. What are we going to do with this terrible anomaly? Peter gets up and he says this, Acts 15, 10. Why? Do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? The Jews couldn't keep the law. They chose not to. They rejected the law. Peter says, are you going to put the yoke of the law on on these new Gentile believers? Verse 11, Peter continues. He said, we believe it is through the grace of the Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. Interesting turnaround of pronoun there. He didn't say they're going to be saved like we were saved. He said we, the Jews, need to be converted the way the Gentiles are being converted, apart from the law, apart from the ways of Judaism, simply by putting their faith in the work of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And the door was opened from the Jews to the Gentiles. Didn't Jesus say this was going to happen? Didn't he say, I'm going to leave Israel and I'm going to give the gospel to the Gentiles? This is what he said would happen. And here now, it's happening. Of course, Acts 1.8, the Great Commission, Jesus' final instruction to his disciples was to what? Go into all the world, not just Jerusalem, not just Israel. You take this message to all the world. Even then, Christ is preparing the way for the gospel to the Gentiles. Because even by then, the Jews had turned their hearts against the Lord. In Romans 11, we learn that God did choose Israel, but that Israel rejected God. And in their rejection of God, they received the curse of God instead. The curse of God, by the way, is upon us all. Are you, are you aware of this? From birth, all of us bear the curse of God because of our sin. There's not a one of us here today that deserves the favor, the goodness of God. All of us deserve His wrath. All of us deserve the curse of God for our sin. But we know Galatians teaches us that Christ took the curse of the Father on Himself so that we could be set free from the curse of our sin However, Israel, rejecting God's favor, remained under God's curse. Didn't used to be that way. Think back with me about King David. How many battles did David lose? You know how many battles David lost? None. Was it because he was an amazing warrior? Or was it because he served an amazing God? There was a time God was with Israel, but in the, in the generation after Solomon, they began to reject God very quickly, and very quickly they began to lose battles. They began to lose soldiers. They began to lose wealth. They began to lose property. The curse of God came upon them when they rejected him. Look with me in Romans 11, verse 7. What then? What the people of Israel sought so earnestly, they did not obtain. The elect among them did, 
but the others were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that could not see, ears that could not hear to this very day. Why did God turn against Israel? Because they rejected him. He loved Israel. They were his chosen people. But they turned their back upon him, and we find they lost the favor of God. So this teaches us that God turned his favor from Israel to the Gentiles. There's two results of this, okay? The first result is that Gentiles around the world have enjoyed the favor of God as the redeemed people of God. Hallelujah. I am so thankful that God turned his attention to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles of this world can have become the redeemed people of God. We who have put our faith in Christ, we who have turned from our sin to the Savior, are the eternal people of God, the redeemed people of God. Just as God redeemed Israel from Egypt, he has redeemed us from the slave market of sin. Just as he set them free physically, he has set us free spiritually. Just as he placed them in a promised land, he has given us a promise of eternal life with him and given us a new life to live even here. Romans 2.28 teaches us that circumcision is no longer of the body. It is now of the heart. The people of God do not need to be of, the tri of one of the tribes, uh, 12 tribes of Israel. The people of God are those whose hearts have been changed through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are thankful. But the second result, Romans 11, 11 and 12, Paul writes this, Did Israel stumble as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression mean riches for the world, and their loss means riches for the Gentile. How much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? The second result is that Israel has become envious of the Gentiles in their position of favor. And throughout time, Jewish men and women have come to know Jesus Christ because they see his grace and peace in Gentiles. You have something we're supposed to have. We don't have it. How do I get it? And we invite them to the Savior. The Jewish Savior, who is their Savior, not only ours, when they come to him. Verses 22 to 24 speak of Israel being grafted back into the vine. Very interesting parallel here. There's the, the vine is the chosen people of God. Israel is cut off of the vine. The Gentiles, as wild branches, are grafted into the true vine. You say, why is that interesting? I had a friend who grafted apple trees. And he, he grew amazing apples, different brands out of one tree. He'd cut the tree, and he'd, he'd cut a branch from a different type of apple tree. And he'd, he'd, he'd graft it in there, and he'd work it until it became part of that tree. And from, from one tree, he'd get two or three different types of apples. I was amazed. I'm a city kid. I don't know anything about grafting. And I was so impressed at his grafting different types of apple branches into one tree. But, but the, Paul says the Gentiles were not a good brand of grape. They were wild branches. Do you understand that thought? We had no value to the vine. A vineyard owner who saw the wild branches would cut them off and burn them. But Paul says, even you wild branches, I've grafted into my vine, and one day I'll restore Israel to my vine, the ones who belonged and were cut off because of their disobedience. Look with me at 1 Peter chapter 2. There's been some theological teaching I, I regret this teaching that Israel is the only people of God, that only true Israel, Jewish people, are ever really going to be the chosen people of God, and that God has a special place in heaven for Jews who are saved. I don't think Peter thought that. I want you to look with me in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. 
because Peter, though he's writing to a Jewish audience, he makes a very clear point here to Gentile believers. In verse 9, he says this, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Now stop right there. Do you know who these words were used to describe in the Old Testament? Who did this describe? Israel, not Gentiles. This was, this was a description carefully used for the nation of Israel, the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Nobody else had the right to use this expression to talk of themselves. But look what Peter says. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Look at verse 10. This is really important. Once you were not a people. But now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy. But now you have received mercy. What did Peter understand? That the elect of the ages, Jews and Gentiles, were together the very chosen, special treasure of God Almighty. Isn't that awesome? We're not second rate, folks, just because we're not Jewish. If you're here today and you are Jewish, God bless you, but you still need to be saved. But those of us Gentiles here today that have never had anything Jewish in our blood, we are the chosen people of God by grace. We were not his people, but now we are. We had not received mercy, but now we have. This is amazing to us. The very description used for Israel, God uses for us, the redeemed Gentiles. Are you still in doubt? Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. It's kind of hard to get away from this one. John has this amazing vision. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude. No one could count. Where was this multitude from, church? It's on the screen if you can't, you know, you can't find it fast enough in your Bible. Every nation, every tribe, every people, every language. Is this only referring to Israel? Remember, Israel rejected God and lost his favor, and God said, I'm going to give my favor to a different people who are not my own. And now we read that there will be a day when people of every nation, every tongue, every tribe will be with the Lord in heaven. Not because we deserve it. We were not his people. We did not have anything to do with him. We did not have his law. We did not have the commandments. We did not have the holy days. We didn't practice any of that. God was not in our DNA. But here we are. And we cry together. We stand before the throne, before the Lamb. We're wearing white robes. We're holding palm branches in our hands. We're crying with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. John sees a heavenly city. It has 12, 12 foundations founded on the 12 apostles. It has 12 gates founded on the 12 tribes of Israel. We have, the, we have the, 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 the promises of God to Israel in the eternal city, but in the very foundation we have the gospel that the apostles preached. And they preached it to Jew and to Gentile. This heavenly city, my brothers and sisters, is for all believers of all time. It is not only a Jewish city. It is for the eternal people of God, those chosen in him from all generations of time. In Romans 11, God reveals a bit of his plan for the salvation of Israel. He does. He has a plan for the salvation of Israel, and he wants Paul to know he has a plan for the salvation of Israel. 
The Gentiles are invited into the vine. Israel, the natural branches, will come back to the God of their fathers, and they will be saved. This true vine, Israel, many, many of Israel will come back into it. But this cannot mean that Israelites, Jews from generations who rejected God and rejected Jesus, are somehow miraculously going to be in heaven. They rejected him in this life. He turned his saving favor from them. And so the idea that one day all Israel is finally going to be going to be brought to heaven by God doesn't find any truth in the scriptures. They rejected him. All who reject him are not there. Jesus spoke pretty harshly to the Pharisees. He spoke pretty harshly about dividing the lamb from the, from the, from the sheep, from the goats. And the result of that division, those who were brought into the Father's kingdom and those who were cast into hell forever. But in Romans 11, verse 30, he says, Just as you were at one time disobedient to God, have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so he may have mercy on them all. What is God's desire for the Gentiles that they be saved? We saw that last week, Romans 10. How can they hear without a preacher? How can they preach except they be sent? If they don't hear, how can they believe? If they can't believe, how can they be saved? This is to all people. Paul's writing this to a Roman church. The message of the gospel is all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. We know this. And yet we know that one day God wants to have mercy on Israel. Who is he going to have mercy on? He'll have mercy on the elect, those whom he has chosen. Those whom he has chosen in him before the foundation of the world. We covered that in Romans chapter 9. You want to go back to Romans 9, you can listen to that. So we spent a lot of time on God's election, those whom God chooses by his grace. But we also know that God chooses those whom he will save. We don't know who that is, do we? And so we're supposed to be proclaiming the message so people can hear. What happens when they hear? Last Sunday, Romans 10. What happens when they hear? They have a chance to what? To call on the name of the Lord and be saved. The moment they're saved, what do we realize? They're part of the elect. We don't know who that is. So we preach the gospel everywhere. I was able to preach the gospel at a funeral yesterday. A friend of uh, John Sowardi's passed away, and the family wanted one Christian service. He said, can you come? I said, absolutely. So John sang, and I preached, and we gave the gospel. Why? Because anybody who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. That's why. We give a gospel invitation. Anybody here today want to know Christ, bow your head and receive him. Before you go to bed tonight, on your knees, cry out to Jesus Christ to be your Savior. Why? Because the moment they cry out to be saved from their sin, God saves them, and they realize they are part of God's chosen. Paul wraps his mind around this. And in verse 33, he says this. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Try nobody, okay? We don't tell God what to do. We don't give him a better idea. Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? Nobody. For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. It's like almost an amazement. Paul realizes the answer to Romans 9.1 and Romans 10.1. God did not reject Israel. Israel still has an opportunity to receive him. God still has people in Israel just as he has amongst the Gentiles, those whom he has chosen before the foundation of the world who will hear and will be saved. 
God is going to save Israel with the same grace he saved the Gentiles. God is not going to wave a magic wand over Israel and say, okay, you were sinners, now you're, now you're Christians. They must humble themselves before God, turn from their rejection of him, receive him as Savior, accept Jesus as their Messiah. And when they do, they will be saved. And in the end, we find there will be one vine, one people of God, living under one promise from the one God for eternity. There are not two peoples of God, there's one people of God. And Paul, understanding this and understanding the beauty of election and the beauty of God's salvation, and yet there are still people in Israel God is going to save. Paul gives us amazing words of praise to him, from him, through him, to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Now, time for the application. A few quick points here that I think you'll help us today. Otherwise, it's just information. Our first application today is this, that God's eternal purpose for our salvation is unchangeable. Dwell upon that with me. God's eternal purpose. How long has God known that you would be saved? For eternity. Before the creation of the world. You are chosen in him. This is God's eternal purpose purpose for our salvation and it is unchangeable you say maybe you're here and you say pastor God could never save me yes he can how do I know because he saved me he can save he will save all who come to him because his salvation is unchangeable God does not treat us in an arbitrary way you know I like you I don't like you uh, you're better than this person you're I'm, I, I'm gonna no His salvation is not arbitrary. He does not change his mind because we stray. Think about that. Israel rejected God, and yet God still held out and said, one day I will save Israel. If you or I were God, we'd have closed the book on Israel, shut it, locked it, and said, I don't care if I ever see you again. You rejected me. You rejected my prophets. You killed my son. I am giving everything I have to the Gentiles. I will never seek you again. But no, God's plans of salvation are unchangeable. And no matter what they did, he still is calling them to be saved. And when God saves us by his eternal purpose, he saves us forever. Don't you love John 3.16? Believe in him will never perish. This is God's eternal purpose for our salvation. Our second application is this. God's steadfast love for his elect is both eternal and it is immeasurable. What this means is that all whom God has chosen, he will have a way to save them. We send out missions. We preach the gospel. We find ways to to, to reach out to people. Why? So they're hearing they can be saved. God calls us to partner with him in the preaching of his message because he has people, created ones, that he has prepared to save. People say, what if I blow it? It's okay. God's love is eternal. It's not going to change. His love is in us. They know we are his because of our his love in us. We can't earn God's love, but neither can we get rid of it because it is steadfast love. Third application is this. All whom God has chosen will be saved. This is a good point. Don't be afraid of election. All whom God has chosen will be saved. Even though our salvation requires the hearing of the gospel, all who call upon him will be saved, and all who are saved are God's chosen. This is not double talk. This is how God puts it. Okay? Don't try to understand it in a way that nobody can. You'll get yourself in trouble. Good people argue and split over trying to figure this out. Let's just be thankful. That all that God chooses will be saved, and all who are saved are part of God's chosen people. There are not any 
whom God has chosen who will not be saved, even though we are the instruments of that message for their salvation. The fourth application is this. We will never fully understand the mind and heart of God. Don't even try. (laughs) You can go to a theological library and you can read books for five lifetimes about what people think about God, and none of them are conclusive because we can't figure them out. And he wants it that way. If we could figure them out, we wouldn't wouldn't need faith. He wants us to believe that he is God, that he is good, and that he wants to save and will save whom he will. Yet with limited understanding, we can safely trust Philippians 1, 6, he who has begun a good work in us, will perform it until the day we stand before his throne with the redeemed Jews and Gentiles of all the ages. Aren't you glad for a saving God that even though we can't understand him, he still wants to reach into our sinful lives and save us. Though we are not Jews, he wants to save us. And he wants to complete his work in us. Therefore, we must rejoice in God's salvation. He's the one that draws people to himself. He's the one who saves and saves eternally. Perhaps you've had conversations with lost people where they weren't the least bit interested. I've had several of those. You may as well be talking to the wall as talking to someone not interested in the gospel. But we, we never know. We never know. Years later, someone may come back to you and say, thank you. Thank you. You thought I wasn't listening, but I was. And God used that message. And God's been working on me ever since. This is the saving power of God. The last application is this. This, this one's not in your bulletin. So if you keep, you're following along, you need to add it. The fifth application is this. For eternity, the glory for our salvation belongs to God. We can't take any credit for it. Not any. We can't even understand it. We argue over how we think it's supposed to be. But Paul concludes Romans 11 with this huge statement of praise to God. Why? Because God's plan for our salvation began before we sinned against him. God's plan for our salvation was given so that we, in Adam and Eve, could be reconciled to him. God was the reconciler. We could not cross that bridge. God's plan for our salvation was prophesied throughout the Old Testament, the place of his birth, his crucifixion, his resurrection. All this was laid out ahead of time. And it was completed in the Lord Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher, the alpha and the omega of our salvation. Therefore, we are absolutely confident. We are absolutely confident that in God's love, for if he did not forsake Israel, he will never forsake us. Think about that. God rejected Israel, but not permanently. He still loved them. He still has them that he will save and is saving. If he did not reject Israel, he's not going to reject you. There's a wonderful take home for us today. Sometimes we don't feel very worthy of God's love. Maybe most days we don't feel worthy of God's love. Neither is Israel. And God didn't forsake Israel, and he's not going to forsake you. Can we say with Paul, Romans 11, 33 again? I'll put it up on the screen for you. Oh, the depth of of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? Can you read verse 36 with me? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Let's not get caught up in trying to figure out all the details of God's salvation. Let's rejoice that he saves. Let's be glad that he wants to save all people. He wants us, even the Gentiles, to be part of his chosen eternal people. Psalm 3.8 says salvation belongs to the Lord. Let us greatly rejoice today in God's salvation 
He has saved our eternal souls. We are thankful that because we called upon Him by faith, He saved us. He has included us into His eternal family. This family is made up of the chosen people of God of all ages, of all tribes, of all tongues, of all nations, who will one day stand before the throne of God together and praise Him. My friend, are you saved today? Do you know the grace of God in your own heart and life? Have you turned from your sin to Jesus? Have you turned from your religion to Jesus? Have you turned from the faith of your parents to Jesus? Are you trusting Him and Him alone to save you? He said, all who come to me I will receive. If you come to Him today, you will not find His arms locked. You'll find His arms open, ready to receive all who come. Lord, thank you today for the clear teachings of your scripture. Lord, the things that aren't clear, you've made them that way on purpose. But the things that are clear, you want us to rejoice in. And so today we rejoice with the Apostle Paul and the wonderful purpose of your salvation, that eternal salvation based in your steadfast love, based in your never-ending grace and mercy. Lord, those of us who know you today are so thankful for that grace. Lord, some here may need to know that grace today. I pray before the day ends, they come on, fall on their face and knees before you and turn from all they are to all that you are and find you calling them your special people. In your name we pray.